everybody, welcome to part two of our interview with Stephanie Kelton. Stephanie Kelton is a brilliant economist, and she worked for Bernie Sanders. She was an advisor for his 2016 presidential campaign. She's here explaining to us how money works. If Greenspan understands how this works like you understand, Barack Obama must understand how this works like you understand. So what's in it for him? And Trump just did the same thing, by the way. They gave a trillion dollar tax cut and then he he froze pay for yeah. the federal employees again. Which What do you get out of doing that? What do they get out of doing that? I don't know, because it would be so easy to do the opposite, opposite. of that and have more voters behind you. So, um, you know, there it's it's like it goes way, way back to the Reagan years when the Republicans used to talk about playing Santa Claus. Yeah. And, you know, the two Santas theory and all this kind of stuff that it was understood that if you can do things when you have power, that even if you're giving the, the lion's share of the benefits to the people at the very top, do something for the broad middle and those at the bottom and you carry everybody. I mean, you have a better chance, right, of carrying everybody along with you in your program and having, you know, voter support and all that kind of stuff. But they don't they don't seem to care. I mean, 31 percent approval or whatever. And he's just keeps hammering away at, at the people at the bottom. And it'd be so easy uh, to give them throw them a bone. So, I mean, FDR understood this. Um, and it's, it's, it's weird how they just, uh, cause, 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 you know, FDR says, uh, famously said that he didn't bring socialism to America. He saved capitalism. And what he told his rich friends is if you don't give some of your money away to these people now, the people, the workers, the, the general people in the population that you're going to, they're going to take all of it away like they did in Russia. Right. So they went along or he got enough of them to go along with it and it worked. Right. So he put money in the pockets of, you know, um, so I just don't understand. Again, it's these like it, it, you can have your cake and eat it, too, in a sense. And like B Bill Clinton, Barack Obama, like Barack Obama is smarter than me. So how come if he understands that? Is it a class thing? Like Chris Hedges says, he just comes from a different class and they just think differently. I don't know. I mean, I didn't work uh, for him or have any role in that administration. I know Gene Sperling was uh, a true believer. I think that um, my understanding from people that did work in the administration that I've spoken with, um, I think that President Obama listened to Gene Sperling on a lot of things. And, you know, he wanted that grand bargain. I mean, oh, he, he really wanted that thing, right? That was going to be a sort of signature achievement. It was sort of an only Nixon can go to China, only a Democrat can do the thing with entitlements. And um, whether it was more of a political calculation or more of, I believe I genuinely have to do this because the economics don't make sense. You know, he really believed that the thing is unsustainable and so the grand, just, like, just so people it. know what that is the grand bargain tell people what that was well this was this um idea that republicans and democrats were going to come together to tighten the noose uh yeah. and and to say look we're going to put everything it was the everything's on the table sort of thing there's and in for a while we were hearing about shared prosperity well pretty soon it became shared sacrifice right everybody's going to hurt we're going to yeah. hurt all of you okay this but is the banks didn't get hurt the banks didn't get hurt no, the banks didn't get hurt. Yeah, at this all. Was, no, so this was we're going to put we're going to make some tough, tough decisions so on entitlements and cuts that's, there. So the grand bargain was Barack Obama then the Democrats were willing to cut Social Security and Medicare. Right. That was the big, and that's the thing that they're not supposed to do in under any situation, and they were willing to do that. Right. right? That's the grand bargain. Right. And okay. it really, I mean, if you're if you're honest, I think you have to say it was the Tea Party. That saved us from ending up with a yeah, grand bargain. It was. It because actually, they said it wasn't enough. It wasn't deep enough. We won't vote for it. So we really have the Tea Partiers to thank for the fact that we didn't gut social or cut Social Security and Medicare. So, uh, first of all, I, I'm really glad that, that we got to talk to you. And I know you don't have a lot of time, but I have one more question. Nancy Pelosi has vowed, by the way, she's going back as leader. <laughs> <laughs> from California. We're the bluest state. We have a super majority here, Democrats, and we keep electing corporatists, Diane Feinstein and Nancy Pelosi, which tells me that the Democratic Party is just lost, right? So she's going to go back to Congress, and she is already committed to a thing called PAYGO, which PAYGO means is that you can never do what you're saying. 
Although the Republicans do it all the time, they come in and they they spend money or cut taxes and they don't care how much it adds to the deficit. And they do all their pet projects and the Democrats never get to do it. And what Nancy Pelosi is saying is we're going to do paygo, meaning whatever program we decide to pay for, we have to either raise taxes or cut that something else equal out of the budget, which cripples a progressive agenda. Correct. I could not say it better. Exactly. It cripples the progressive agenda. It commits the government to saying for every one we put in, we're going to take that one back out. Nothing net for you. And and it hamstrings your ability to, I think, move any kind of progressive legislation. You're not going to do big, ambitious things if under a pay go. So now is that is that Nancy Pelosi just being misguided? Is she just doesn't understand how stuff works? No, no she, she's, she's a dumber. true believer. Did she went on to the House floor after Pete Peterson oh. died, right? The billionaire uh, fixed the debt and the Peterson Foundation and the can kicks back with the little guy in the can costume running around college campuses telling young people that Social Security is never going to be there for them. This guy funds all of this apparatus of, you know, pro- of institutes designed to to go after Social Security and Medicare. And after he died recently, Nancy Pelosi took to the House floor to give, you know, a big a big speech lamenting his death and thanking him for all of the great and important work he did to bring the importance of fiscal responsibility and the dangers of the deficit and all that kind of stuff. So I think she's a believer. So that's uh, so no matter if Bernie Sanders gets elected president, he has to deal with uh, someone like. Nancy Pelosi, even if there's a blue wave and they take over Congress, Nancy Pelosi is not going to ever. So that means we'll never have Medicare for all is what that means, because she would, according to Nancy Pelosi, we'd have to raise taxes, thirty two trillion dollars. Anyway, she's it's just and right. So right now in New York, Andrew Cuomo just defeated Cynthia Nixon. So now is Cynthia Nixon supposed to tell progressives to vote for Andrew Cuomo, who the New York Times editorial board called one of the sleaziest move sleazy and one of the lowest uh, dealers in politics? We're supposed to go vote for that guy now. Is that what's going to happen with the Democrats? I don't know what's going to happen. I, I live in New York now and I voted yesterday. Um, I, I doubt she's going to be speaking out vocally as a champion for um, rounding up votes for Andrew Cuomo. But I. OK, it's just it's just a head scratcher to me how yeah. people who can vote for Cynthia Nixon can then bring themselves to vote for the Democrat version of Donald Trump, which is Andrew Cuomo. Um, so and that's why this will never happen and we'll all be dead soon because climate change is coming. And uh, the Democrats didn't do anything about that either when they had complete control. People forget that Barack Obama had complete control of government and a filibuster-proof Senate for a few months. And imagine if what if the Republicans had that, what they would do. They would cram everything in the world in those two months in, and they would get it done. The Democrats couldn't even get a goddamn public option. You know why? Because their donors don't want them to have it, which is why we got Donald Trump. He is, as Chris Hedges says, a visage of a broken democracy. So trying to fix the... So, you know, voting for Democrats is not going to fix this problem, right? <laughs> I, I I don't know, Jimmy. I got to say, I got to believe. What's the alternative? Who are we going to vote for? Like right now in 2018 or in 2020, how do we get to where we want to be? I don't know the answer to that. But I see some really inspiring candidates who happen to be running as Democrats. But they're, you know, they're winning seats, Jimmy. They are. They're winning House seats. They're winning seats in the state legislature. We just had a big victory here in the state of New York yesterday. We got the IDC. We're, you're, we're doing some things. It's incremental. It's frustrating. Um, I don't know how to do it in one fell swoop, but I wish we could. Yeah, I know. So the incremental is we're going to get us killed. <laughs> Because climate change is coming. So incrementalism isn't working. That's what we've been doing. Bernie Bernie asked for a... Pro- so you know when Bernie would start off his, um, his campaign speeches, he would say, it sounds like you're ready for a revolution. And then he'd turn around and back to Hillary Clinton. And now he's really doing incrementalism. Like you said, that's what we're all doing now is incrementalism. Well, when I meant, in, I didn't mean incrementalism in terms of what we what we reach for with policy. I meant incremental victory. So you win some, you lose. We're we're picking up increment. We're making incremental progress, is what I meant in right. terms of getting the kinds of candidates I think you and I both want to see more of elected to office. 
Yeah. Okay. Well, it's so uh, it's I'm really disappointed. It's very disappointing. Um, it's not happening. There is no progressive takeover of the Democratic Party. They've they've met. You know how many corporate Democrats that they've effectively primaried? One, Joe Crowley. That's it. Anyway, and now you know Cortez has to tell people to vote for Andrew Cuomo because she's a Democrat. It's gross. It's disgusting. You know. Um, but anyway, that's not. I don't. You're here to talk about economics, and you did. And you did a great job. Hey, let me ask. I'm here to throw paper. That's okay. why I'm here. But can I let me ask you one more economic question? So now I don't want to put my money in the stock. Like, so retirement money, I'm supposed to put my money in 401ks. What do people do if because I know it's going to crash again, right? Well, it probably will crash again. But the the reality is that it, it will go up after it crashes. And you're a young guy. So but I've I've been told. And isn't this true that they've pulled all the they've done all the tricks they can. And because the interest rates are so low, so the next time it crashes, there's less stuff for them to do. And it might not be it not. We might not come out of it like we did this last time. Is that true? No, no. Never underestimate the creativity of a central banker. Really? Oh, yeah. I mean, we we haven't even warmed up here in the U.S. They got some real stuff going on in Japan and the ECB in Europe. Oh, yeah. And these other countries, central banks are buying stocks. They're buying corporate bonds. They will find things to buy. If we're lucky, maybe they'll buy student loan debt and we'll figure out how to get them to uh, write it off after they buy it. I have a paper on that. So was Jill Stein right about that, that the, we could have done, qu- qu- you know, a version of quantitative easing on student debt? So she was right in the sense that we could cancel it, but she wasn't right in the way that she talked about it, because unfortunately, she talked about it as if you could carry it out the same way the Fed did quantitative easing. Quantitative easing was an asset swap. It was the Fed buying treasuries and mortgage backed securities, but it didn't cancel those things. Right. People still continue to pay their mortgage and so forth. So you didn't get off the hook as because of what the Fed did. So. In our research paper, we show how the Fed could actually buy the student loan debt and then tell students, tell people who pay their debt, you don't have to pay it back. Okay. And the paper walks through how you could actually do that. Really? All right. Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks again for spending this much time with us. I appreciate you doing this. And, uh, you know, uh, you're the leading thinker on this, and it's really an honor to have you here. So thanks for doing this. I'm happy to do it. Thanks, Jimmy. Okay. Please make sure you're subscribed. Even if you think you are subscribed, there's a good chance you're not. So please check. It only takes a second. And then click that bell. And that's how you know you'll get a notice every time we drop a video. They still won't notify you every time we drop a video, but that's the best we can do. Plus, if you like the show, you want to support it, please become a patron. We give you hours of bonus material every week. And come see a live show. Go to jimmydorecomedy.com for our live schedule.